want to ask you a question today here on The Perspective. Have you ever been in a situation you say, how on earth did I ever get here? What is this all about? Maybe you're looking back on life and you're saying, oh my goodness, did I make a mistake back then? And am I being punished for it right now? I want us to move past that thinking today, not only through our Bible teaching, but as we uh, visit with uh, a biologist who has taught in numerous universities, uh, he was trained at the University of uh, Waterloo here in Ontario. He's taught at University of British Columbia, University of Guelph, and San Diego uh, State University. And now he is teaching uh, in Dubai, uh, just outside of the, uh, the city. How does that happen? How do we see God orchestrating our life? I want you to welcome with me uh, Dr. John Claronimus. He was on the show about a year ago. And uh, welcome back, John. Glad you're with us. Oh, so great to be here. Thanks for having me, Mike. You know, John, the last time uh, we did a program, you actually were in the studio and uh, you were actually living in Kelowna, BC, and that is technically still your residence. I remember at that point, you were an advisor to the Minister of Health in British Columbia as we were trying to unpack COVID. How was it going to spread? What was going to happen? And you brought some incredible insights into navigating uh, the pandemic as Canadians. But now <laughs> you're in Dubai. Uh, I don't think a year and a half ago, you could have imagined God orchestrating uh, this uh, whole episode in your life. Yeah, no, I wasn't expecting it back then either. Uh, but, um, you know, there was an opportunity to come here. Uh, I was offered a position here. Uh, they need help building an environmental science program. It's in a part of the world that I don't really know much about. I didn't have much experience with. Uh, I don't seem to be able to stay in one place for too long anyways. <laughs> so every decade or so, I need to move around. So here I am. Well, that's a big move, and I'm waiting for the invite to come and visit you because it sounds like a fascinating place. Oh, you're uh, invited, Mike. Okay. Uh, if we could book a flight right after the show, that would be fantastic. Uh, John, you're a follower of Jesus, and you're teaching in a Muslim country. And, and God seems to have just given you great favor. Uh, the people are delighted that you're there. Your research credentials have given you, in a sense, an elevated position. Uh, how do you process all of those different things, and how do you navigate uh, being a Christian in a, in a country that uh, is, for sake of anything, it's you know ninety nine percent Muslim? Yeah, no. At the beginning, I was uh, actually thrilled at the idea of coming. Uh, then I got really nervous about coming. Uh, all kinds of emotions are associated with that, largely because, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure what it would be like being here as a Christian. But I realized that uh, it's actually quite open here. It's definitely a Muslim country, uh, but you can practice your faith as long as, you know, there are some rules <laughs> that you have to follow. Um, but actually, Mike, I have to say that uh, the one thing I've been here for half a year or so, and um, I feel that it's uh, done wonders for me. I feel so much closer to Jesus being here uh, compared to even being back home. Uh, and I can expand on that if you wish. But Yeah, uh, no, I'd like you to because you're very isolated in one sense. And I don't think any of us like loneliness, being away from family and friends. Um, so unpack that. How has your relationship with God uh, been impacted? Yeah, I mean, the easiest way to explain it would be just simply that, you know, back home I took, uh, even though, you know, I've been a Christian now for about four years. Uh, I was reborn about four years ago and I got baptized and uh, I was excited, right, at home back in BC, back in Canada, at being a Christian. But I would still take it for granted. And largely I would take it for granted because I was surrounded by so many other Christians. And then coming here, uh, suddenly you're surrounded by people that aren't like you. They don't have the same belief system as you. They're very respectful. It's it's great that way. But it, make, it has uh, allowed me to really think about what my belief system is and who I am. So I focused a lot more on my identity here than I did back home and my identity in Christ uh, compared to back home. So even though you're right, I feel uh, lonely sometimes. I, I do. Uh, I feel less alone 
you know, I, than I did uh, even back home, which is strange to say. I'd like you to talk about that for a moment. What do you mean when you're referring to your identity in Christ? And how does that help, you know, keep your bearings uh, straight? Well, one of the, I, yeah, well, like I said, four years ago, uh, prior to that, I wasn't a Christian. I would have considered myself agnostic, maybe even an atheist. Uh, and uh, my identity was in myself. I was just, I had so much pride in relation to things that I was accomplishing. Let's accomplish more and more and more. And, um, you know, I would worship those things uh, until one day I uh, realized that I was worshiping nothing. And mm -hmm. um, uh, I, there wasn't anything more for me to accomplish in many ways, right? Because I felt like, oh, okay, I've won that award and I've won that award and I had that position and this position. And so... Then, then what do you do when you get to that final position you're looking for? Uh, so uh, that was when I really crashed. And uh, I needed Jesus in my life. And uh, I had friends, close friends that helped me get there. Um, so that's what I mean by my identity in Jesus. So even though here I'm rebuilding uh, other things and I have new positions and I'm meeting new people. And uh, I feel like I'm also influential here quite a bit. I could easily fall back into that trap of feeling like that's actually something. <laughs> and uh, and I uh, remind myself every day, it actually is nothing, right? That's nothing to kind of hold your to grip on. So uh, I feel that's where um, it's really useful daily to just remind myself uh, what's in my heart, you know, what my, what my framework is. You know, John, uh, and many that times keeps me from being lonely. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, many times when I talk to people, they'll say, you know, I'm not sure what I should do with my life. I'm not sure, uh, you know, if I've got anything to offer. And, and how does that relate to my Christian faith? Uh, we're going to unpack that in the second part of the interview today, but I'd like to take a few moments before we go to the break for you to share with our viewers um, the kind of research work that you were doing in Canada, why it is so important, and, and one of the dreams that you had for other parts of the world, how to help people. And, and then, it, you know, if there's the third part of the triangle, there's in Canada, what you want to do in the other world, but why Dubai? Because it's a pretty self-sufficient uh, uh, environment and uh, economy. So what did you do? that to, you won so many uh, awards, accolades? Well, uh, as you said earlier, I'm a biologist, but I'm an environmental biologist that focuses on uh, plants in uh, plant biology and plant ecology in uh, nature. Uh, and one of the areas that I work on is how to uh, grow plants in very harsh environments, such as uh, uh, agricultural plants, for example, crops, food. Um, and, um, uh, you know, you're right, coming to the UAE, uh, considering that it's self-sustaining, it's a rich country, you know, they, they're fine here. But we have to remember they're actually living in a desert. They've built all this in a desert, uh, and they have a lot of food insecurity. Uh, you know, a lot of it is built on oil, and it's built on tourism now. Um uh, but they have some major environmental problems. Uh, and so that's part of the reason why I feel I can really contribute here as they transition over into, hey, they need to grow their own food too. Um, and, uh, and of course, we can talk more about other parts of the world too, you know, that need that kind of help. Well, I know that's a big passion in your heart to uh, help uh, people that are in impoverished situations to turn their environment into a sustainable living. Um, when you think about that and the fact that you became a follower of Jesus about four, four and a half years ago, how did you see those two worlds colliding? I didn't back then at all. I thought they were going to be separate parts of my life, especially since, um, as you can imagine, uh, being in a university setting, um, not so much here because people here have their own faiths. You know, they're not all Christians, but they have their own faith. But especially in North America, being a biologist means you're you're working in a department that is pretty much atheist, right? Um, 
So uh, it wasn't something that I would talk about that much in my department. I kept those lives separate. And uh, only recently coming here that I realized I have an opportunity to kind of blend the two. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there are many places around the world that actually are Christian uh, or they're becoming Christian. And uh, they also are so poor and have problems growing their own food. And I feel like I contribute to that. Right? You're listening to Dr. John Coronimus. You're watching The Perspective. And at any time you'd like prayer to talk to somebody, there's a number to call on your screen, 855-910-6297. Or you can write to me personally, Mike at theperspective.tv or prayer at theperspective.tv. It'll come right to my desk. We're going to be back in just a moment to hear more of this amazing story. Will you donate two hours of your time? Crossroads Prayer Center is seeking people with a heart willing to join in the amazing work God is doing through prayer. Providing over 1,300 prayer interactions daily, Crossroads Prayer Partners speak biblical truth and words of life over people's needs. Join in God's transforming work through prayer and enrich your faith. Learn more at crossroads.ca slash prayer volunteer. We're back today with uh, Dr. John Claronimus, and John is uh, living just outside of Dubai in the uh, UAE. And John, as we were talking about being a Christian in a, a Muslim country, God has given you great favor. I know you truly enjoy the people that you're working with and that you're teaching in the university there, but you've also had opportunity to go to two different countries while you've been in Dubai. Countries that are in need of biological, uh, I was going to say biological help, but the experience of a, of a biologist to give them help in planting uh, crops that will actually flourish in harsh conditions. Um, talk to us about going to India and, uh, and Bangladesh. Maybe start with Bangladesh because you had a neat opportunity there. And something that has shaped your life that I'd like you to talk about is uh, a discipleship course called the Story Shape Life or Story Shape Living. Okay, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. I'm just going to let you run with it because it's an amazing story for you to unpack. Uh, yeah, I did. I uh, um, well, again, one of my uh, responsibilities here at the university is to conduct research and to conduct research where uh, I help. Uh, we try and figure out ways to increase food security in places that don't have much of food security. And um, Bangladesh is one of those places. They uh, are hit by cyclones on a regular basis. And because of that, all that seawater ends up falling on their land. And because of that, their land becomes very salty and salty soil is just not a place where you can grow food all that easily. So mm -hmm. uh, the research I do uh, helps them solve that problem. We have ways, right, where we can solve that problem. And I, I don't really want to get into too much of the details on that. But um, so I did go there and uh, to try and help me figure out how to get around, I connected with a Christian organization that uh goes to very remote places in uh, Bangladesh. And uh, the places where I was helping people were in their, basically in these very remote, really remote places. You'd be shocked at how remote they are. Um, and uh, helping them with their uh, kitchen gardens, essentially, right? Uh, and I have a big project back here in conjunction with the Bangladeshi people, right? Trying to help them out. Well, I think it's kind of fascinating that you had a, a passion through a mutual friend uh, of ours, my daughter, Ashley, to see something happen in Bangladesh. And now it's uh, at your university, right now we're at, that your students are working at unpacking that problem and providing solutions. So who could have imagined that God would have orchestrated all of that? 
Um, story Shape Living, what is that? And tell us about your recent trip to India, of all things. So, uh, yes, yeah, Story Shape Living is a discipleship course that is based out of Kelowna, BC. Uh, 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 the church there that I belong to and that Ashley belongs to as well. You know, we, uh, we run, uh, we run that, uh, and, um, it, uh, involves people from India. It involves people from here in the UAE. It involves people from Canada. It's meant to be an international course. Uh, it's really about, it's a six week course on how to walk with Jesus, what it means to have Jesus in your life. Um, and, um, how to get him into your heart, really, right? What that, what does that mean exactly? So, uh, because I was going to India anyways for research, uh, this was an opportunity then to conduct my research there, and also <laughs> to spend a little bit of time with a church that's there, uh, that's part of this course as well. So, um, again, here's an example where my work and my uh, faith uh, come together. And I could accomplish both. And I think that that is probably one of the most satisfying things to be able to like live a life where both sides of myself could come together and uh, I don't have to keep them separate, really. Right. And, and I think the interesting thing with the discipleship program and for folks that are watching a discipleship program is 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 designed to help people unpack the truths of the Bible so they understand how to know Christ more and to walk with him. So here you are in India, and uh, you know the ticket is paid. You're able to do your work. You find a local church through other connections, and that's just an amazing story. And a week ago, you helped set up the Zoom call where they could be taught, and the church gathered together. And now for the next six or seven weeks, every weekend, they're going to be gathering together. And, uh, and you and Ashley and Kelowna and different people are going to be participating in teaching them uh, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, I yeah, keep going we, back. We only, had, we only had a couple of people from uh, India connect in previous weeks, and now we're going to have 30 or so. So, yeah, so it's it's quite remarkable. Yeah. And you know, I keep going back to eight or 10 months ago when you're making this huge decision where you would move to and what teaching post you would take. And as God directed you there, I mean, who could have imagined? Who could have imagined? Uh, you've got a fun story of somebody you've encountered uh, in the UAE who you've taught to play squash. You got to tell us that story. He's a young man. He's about, you know, he's under 30. Uh, and he, I decided to join the sports club just because I just needed something to do that wasn't just work. Uh, and uh, one of my passions is to play racket sports. I like playing squash, and he had never played squash before, but he decided that he was going to play with me. Uh, I met him there. He's from Nigeria. Okay. A wonderful, wonderful friend. He's become a really close friend, and he's also now connecting to this discipleship course as well. Uh, and uh, it's kind of a funny story because I know how to play squash a little bit more than he does, but uh, because he's so much younger than me, <laughs> he, he can outrun me. And now we're uh, trying to get him to the uh, Nigerian Olympic team, right? That's the running joke anyways. Okay, so that's kind of <laughs> like the, uh, the Jamaican bobsled team story. Is that right? And now here you yes, are teaching man. this guy. He's in a Bible <laughs> study with you. You're doing uh, story form life. And you're, I can't believe it, John, you're coaching him uh, for, to make the Olympic team in Nigeria. I mean, who would have thought about that? Who would have thought I would be John Candy, right? <laughs> <laughs> you need to grow a little more hair, just a little more hair, and then you would fit the time. We got about 30 exactly. seconds left. What is one of the resounding truths that's in your heart right now, things that you want to share with viewers? Um, I just, um, well, I, you know, I was scared to go away. I was scared to go, uh, and travel far away and leave people behind. But I feel that, uh, having done so, uh, even though, like I said, it does get lonely sometimes, uh, I feel that, uh, I am so much 
uh, closer to God, so much closer to Jesus, and also so much closer to my Christian family and friends uh, back in Canada. Uh, I think about them all the time. And I feel that they're not really that far away because of that, right? I don't know what it would have been like had I been here, uh, had I not found Jesus. It would have been a very different experience. John, I want to thank you for sharing a bit of your story. And I will look forward a little later on to having you back on to tell us how the plants are growing, how the church is growing, <laughs> and how your, uh, your squash uh, game has improved. But thanks for taking the time to be with us. Thank you so much, Mike. Hi, I'm Ryan Walter, and playing in the NHL, I was so fortunate to win a Stanley Cup ring. So thankful with the Montreal Canadiens in 1986. Now, Jenny and I, we had the ring in our home, and we lost the ring. Can you believe losing a Stanley Cup ring? Couldn't find it. We looked everywhere. We were scouring. Finally found it in the drawer of our, our daughter, Christy. <laughs> she was young, she took the ring, it must have been sparkly, and, and she put it in her drawer. Uh, here's what I'd like to leave you with. So in Mark 10, it says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you'll find it. We were seeking, uh, knock and the door will be opened. Three great ideas in our Christian walk. Ask, seek and knock. If you've ever thought your life is a fluke, that everything is happening by chance, I want to contradict that mindset. I'm going to teach against it right now. I want you to fasten your seatbelts because in light of what John was just sharing in his whole story of how God uprooted him from Kelowna to take him to Dubai, to be teaching in a desert, to have influence in the country of Bangladesh and in India is uh, a message, not just for him, but it can be a truth that you can experience as well. We're going to go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Ruth. And remember, we are calling this series of talks, Messy Lives. And we're thinking, what happens when things get screwed up? Can God undo the mess? Can he unscramble the eggs? Can he make an omelet out of that mess that's lying on the plate? And the answer is he can do that and more. And I want to take you to Ruth chapter 2. Ruth is the, uh, the Moabite lady. She's a foreigner back in the land of Israel. She's with Naomi, her uh, mother-in-law, although Naomi's husband has died and uh, Naomi's son, who was Ruth's husband, he has died as well. Tragedy everywhere, and they're on Skid Row. No food. And here's what we read in the scripture. It says that Naomi uh, had a relative of her husband's side. He was a, of the clan of Elimelech. He was a man whose name was Boaz. And Ruth said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of green after ears of grain after him whose sight I shall find favor. She's saying, basically, I just hope there's somebody there and I will find favor, trusting that God would meet the need. And so she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And here's the phrase I want you to hear today. And it says, and she happened to come to the part of the field that belonged to Boaz. She didn't realize that this little section was the field that Boaz owned, that portion, it says she happened. She hadn't planned it, but as she was surrendering herself to God, he was directing her in all his ways. And folks, here's an incredible truth. As you choose to walk with God, just like John was sharing his own story four and a half years ago, he was not a follower of Jesus. And now he's surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus in his life. He's being led in a way that I could never have scripted. I remember him having the conversation with me 10, 12 months ago about where he should go. And actually, when he chose to go there, I was thinking, yeah, I'm not sure that's the right place. But as he sensed that's where God was leading him, we can see the reason why. And Ruth, in the same situation, is being led to go to the field, the portion of the field that belongs to Boaz. We're going to see in coming uh, lessons that Boaz is a distant redeemer. And he is going to be the one that God ultimately will use to uh, bring Ruth and Naomi into a place of safety as eventually he will marry Ruth. Neither of them knew how this was going to work out. And I love the phrase, she happened to come to the part 
of the field that belonged to Boaz. I think of the story of another man, his name was Joseph in the Old Testament. And Joseph is suddenly thrown into prison for a crime that he didn't do. Um, But the Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph. And later on in life, about seven years later, as he is the means that God uses to alleviate famine in the land, his own brothers come, the ones who had treated him so harshly. And now they're fearful that he's going to wipe them out, that he's going to find vengeance. And Joseph could say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Let me come back to this little phrase. Ruth happened to go to the field. Where you're at today is not by chance. But where you go tomorrow in the decisions you make is critical if you surrender to Jesus. To start following him and saying, Lord, I know I've made mistakes. I'm here in this situation and it's possibly a mess. But now I'm going to believe that you have a reason for me here and you have a plan. And as we surrender to his plan for our life, as we give our mess to the master, he is the one who can make it straight and lead us in a way that will bring life to your own heart today. That little phrase that I've been teaching on, and she happened, reminds me over and over again that nothing happens by chance, that God is working out his ultimate plan. It's not by chance that you're watching the program today either. And I want to leave you with two uh, opportunities. One is an opportunity to go to our website, theperspective.tv, and you could send me a note to encourage me. to let me know that you're watching the program. Just go and click on theperspective.tv. If you write prayer at theperspective.tv, you can send me a prayer request. And I will be happy to pray with you because I believe God answers prayer. If you choose to click on the donate button, we would be so grateful as we want to share the message of God's love all across our country. Would you help me in that endeavor? I need people to stand with me. But more importantly than anything else, the reason I do this program is so that people can experience the life-changing power of Jesus Christ, which has changed my life, which has changed John's life. It's his power that changed Ruth's life as she surrendered to him. And I'd love to invite you to surrender your heart today to Jesus, to say, Lord, I'm going to put my life in your hands. I'm trusting you to be my Savior, to be my Lord and friend. And if you're asking him to do that, he will hear that prayer. Write to me prayer at the perspective.tv. I want to hear about your decision to say yes to Jesus today.